The first speaker of the se second session will be David Sashkiewicz from Saarland University. He is holding uh, a chair of general and inorganic chemistry there. He obtained his PhD from Philips Univer University of Mar uh, Marburg, and then he went to Toulouse, Riverside, and Zurich, coming back to Würzburg when he made a habilitation. So after a round trip, you came back to Germany. Then went for a short period of time to, to Imperial College London, and finally moved back to, to uh, moved to Saarland University at Saarbrücken. Uh, David Soskiewicz obtained um, uh, many important awards, uh, mostly German awards, and his ma major interests are synthesis of heavy alkene homologs and the peripheral functionalization of double bond and on synthesis of unsaturated stable small group 14 clusters and their deriv derivatization and low valent group 14 ligands for use in catalysis. Yes? Chair is yours. Okay. Floor is yours. Um, thank you very much for the kind introduction and uh, let me start by thanking Clara and uh, Eva and the organizing committee for inviting me to present uh, some of our results today. But now, uh, the title is uh, Unsaturated Main Group Systems uh, Beyond the Carbon Copy. Do you hear me? No? Okay. You lost oh, I lost my mic. Oh. Well. Now, is this better? Do you hear me okay now? All right. <laughs> So, um, well, the title of my talk is, is uh, Unsaturated Main Group Systems Beyond the Carbon Copy. And um, so this will mostly concern silicon, but, but also a few other elements like uh, germanium and, and, and phosphorus. Now, um, what about uh, Saarland University? It, it's actually the first uh, university founded in Germany after the Second World War in uh, 90. 57, I think, or no, 1947. Uh, only that uh, Saarland was not part of Germany back then. It was under French administration. This is why um, our uh, region is, uh, is it's very close to the French border, so we are uh, almost bilingual. Um, I think our prime minister would be very happy if I said uh, that I said that. Um, in reality, it's not quite the case, but anyway, um, a lot of French influx in, in terms also of eating. Uh, we have, uh, I, I'm proud to say, the best kitchen, best cuisine in Germany. There's no doubt about that. And uh, also interesting tourist sites like the River Saar Loop um, and a lot of woods, so hiking is very nice there. Um, but uh, to chemistry, before I get to chemistry, I would actually like to um, acknowledge the people who, who did this work. Um, so my, my group is listed here, my cur current mem group members. Uh, we have entertained a lot of collaborations. The collaborators are listed here. And of course, uh, we need money uh, to carry out researchers, everyone else. Now, so this group was already mentioned at least once during this conference in the uh, talk by Eva Marie Hay Hawkins. Um, famous book by uh, Francois Maté, uh, uh, um, uh, Keith Dillon, and, and John Nixon, who are shown here. And, and this stresses the parallels between phosphorus and carbon. Um, a few examples of um, how phosphorus behaves like carbon are, are shown here. For instance, this uh, inorganic metallocene by John Ellis, um, then these phosphorus, unsaturated phosphorus containing polymers of, of Derek Gates, and uh, um, by this bisphosphoalkene with carbon phosphorus triple bonds um, prepared in the Jones group in, in 2003. So, 
And, and this kind of reflects uh, a, a situation that has been governing um, the chemistry of heavier main group elements for a very long time. And that is uh, building bridges to carbon chemistry, showing similarities to carbon chemistry. And as it has been alluded to in, in, in many talks, actually uh, main group compounds, in particular phosphorus, silicon, and also boron, this boron despite being in the, in the um, second row of the periodic table, uh, show different behavior from carbon. And uh, while I freely admit that for a very long time our main interest was exactly that, reprodu reproducing carbon chemistry with silicon, um, our interests have developed uh, partly, partially in, in a different direction in more recent times. And uh, so the lecture will be divided in, in, in two parts. In the first part I will give you uh, an overview or on, on some selected examples of, of what we have been doing to replicate carbon chemistry. In the second part, it'll be the other way around. I will show them the, some major differences bet predominantly between silicon and carbon. Now, um, organosilicon chemistry started with the uh, um, work by Frederick Kipping in the early 20th century where he actually, let me go back, claimed in 1911 to have prepared the first disilene, so a compound with a silicon-silicon double bond, only he had to correct himself uh, only 10 years later um, that, as a matter of fact, a, a, a cyclotetrasilane, so a four-membered ring was formed, which uh, was the first indication that silicon prefers single bonds um, rather than, than entertaining unsaturated systems. However, um, then a landmark study by Bob West, uh, Joseph Mikkel, and uh, uh, Mike Fink um, showed that using bulky substituents like this methyl group, you can actually stabilize a disilene, which structurally looks uh, a bit different, but um, nonetheless uh, shows a, a bona fide silicon-silicon double bond. And um, so this... Um, was, was the basis for when, when we came into that arena in the, in the uh, early 2000s <coughs> and started um, to uh, uh, work on, on, on the functionalization of silicon-silicon double bonds as shown here with this disilinide featuring a bulky TIP group, um, 246 triisopropyl phenyl group. And uh, you can use that um, as a... As a uh, you can produce this in, on a 100 gram scale, this compound, and you can use it for the transfer of silicon silicon double bonds to uh, many, many substrates, inc including um, aromatic um, halides, and uh, attach the silicon silicon double bond virtually at will uh, to anything of that sort. As a matter of fact, we have unpublished examples where we can transfer up to six silicon silicon double bonds to, to substrates. And th these systems can show interesting properties. They are not exactly the best luminophores um, you can imagine due to quenching, but uh, uh, um, nonetheless, we have some results in this regard, luminescent materials. Um, this doesn't really look like it luminesces, and this is the reason for that is that it shows luminescence in the near IR, so you can't see it with the uh, naked eye. Um, now, um, we also produce small ring systems with unsaturated small ring systems like this cyclopropene analog shown here. Um, and uh, here, uh, in, in, in contrast to the cyclopropene, the carbon derivative, this is highly reactive. Of course, it, it reacts with oxygen and moisture and all that sort, but it also activates um, maybe more interesting small molecules like carbon monoxide, which is shown here. And I will explain the formation of this compound in a second. It, you actually suspect maybe already that this is a dimer of an intermediate species. And here a parallel to organic chemistry becomes obvious as well. Um, so we uh, propose that the intermediate of this reaction is actually a pi addition to, of carbon monoxide to the silicon-silicon double bond. Uh, which gives a species that can be described as a, a disilyl, one free disilyl oxyallyl um, 
uh, a species with a certain diuretic character, hence highly reactive, which then dimer would dimerize to give the uh, compound you've seen on the previous slide. Now we can also trap this. Um, this contains an electrophilic center and a nucleophilic oxygen atom. So if we react this with an electrophile like trimethylsilide triflate, um, the triflate sure enough attacks the electrophilic silicon atom and uh, the trimethylsilide group goes to the oxygen and you get this cyclobutene analog. Um, you can also uh, trap it by uh, Lewis acids, pure Lewis acids like the uh, uh, trispentafluorophenylborane, uh, which then attaches to the oxygen atom and gives this switterionic structure shown here, which uh, as a reviewer of this, the paper when we submitted it pointed out um, contains, also contains two silicon atoms with uh, 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 approaching a planar tetra-coordinate coordination environment, which is an interesting side note, but, but maybe not the main purpose of our work here. Now, as I said, this is, uh, resembles organic chemistry. Um, Sorensen has prepared such a, a bicyclobutanone, which, as he had shown convincingly, also features a certain oxyallyl character. And uh, uh, somewhat more recently, in the groups of Bertrand and uh, Siemeling, um, by reaction, spontaneous reaction of stable carb uh, beans, carbenes with uh, carbon monoxide, uh, stable oxyallyls were also described in the purely organic framework. Now, if carbon monoxide reacts, uh, um, which is a carbene in a sense, why not use and heterocyclic carbenes and look what they're doing to the cyclotricyline and we did this um, and as it turns out this the reaction that occurs is actually an equilibrium reaction um, as shown here the cyclotricyline is opened ring opened and uh, you obtain the adduct with an in equilibrium the adduct with the anhydrocyclic carbene <coughs> which is an intensely green compound, uh, almost black crystalline material, um, but as the NMR shows you when it dissolves these, uh, these crystals, you also see besides the characteristic signal of the silicon-silicon double bond, you also see the starting material and initially I told Mike uh, Cowley when he showed me the spectra, well this isn't quite pure, but th then we realized um, it is actually in equilibrium. This is a spectrum at 233 Kelvin at room temperature. This is actually mostly dissociated already and this is a fully reversible system, which we found interesting in the context of, of, of catalysis because um, as uh, you are all aware, for catalytic cycles, reversibility is, is uh, absolutely mandatory. Now, um, <coughs> Uh, the, also, the vinyl carbene is an intermediate. In organic chemistry, it has never been isolated. Uh, vinyl carbenes are fleeting, um, but they have been studied uh, by spectroscopic techniques in the gas phase. And uh, similar to what you've just seen, by addition of a base like pyridine, um, this becomes at least observable. This is an unobservable intermediate, but, but uh, the pyridine adduct can be observed as shown by Sheridan and co-workers. Now, um, so the silicon-silicon double bond is a reality, but uh, as I already alluded to, there is quite a few substantial differences. And uh, um, most foremost difference is certainly the comparator to, uh, comparable weakness of the silicon-silicon uh, double bond. This has been realized relative early on in work by Ziegler. He has uh, calculated the um, uh, energy as a function of the interatomic distances. And uh, uh, as you can see in comparison to, to ethylene, um, the bond distance in the minimum is f firstly much, uh, the bond energy in the minimum is firstly most much weaker. And secondly, the uh, potential energy surface is also much more shallow which allows for a considerable conformational flexibility of this bond, as had already been shown by West 
with his uh, with this iconic disilene, um, which, uh, depending on the crystallization conditions, shows different structures like almost planar in as a THF solvate or um, transband and twisted as a as a toluene solvate, for instance. <coughs> now this has consequences. The weakness of the bond, of course, is also reflected in a much smaller homolumo gap. And uh, I will not dwell on that, but uh, the deformation from planarity um, in transbending and in twisting in both cases causes a, a further weakening of the homolumo gap. Now, what's the reason for that? And um, this is actually something taken from my undergrad lectures. Um, very often we do uh, fairly complicated theoretical computations in order to uh, go to the bottom of, of uh, why things behave like they behave, but, but in reality the explanation can at least be much simpler because, I mean, what's the basis of computations? Atoms, right? And if we look at the atomic size of silicon in comparison to carbon, um, we realize that the increase in covalent radius is uh, the most prominent when you go from the second row to the third row of the periodic table. The increase is almost more than 50% um, while um, then going further down in the group the increase is much less prominent. So this has a, a, a few implications. Now in terms of hybridization for, for organic chemistry the valence bond theory is, is very prominent. It easily explains stuff by hybridization. Um, in alkenes, for instance, you have an sp2 hybridization, and the fragments, the constituting fragments of the alkenes are carbenes. There as well, you can invoke sp2 hybridization. Now, does carbon want to hybridize? No, it costs energy, right? Hybridization requires energy, and um, this is shown here. Now, if you look at uh, unhybridized carbon and uh, consider the van der Waals radii of adjacent carbon atoms, you realize that it, at, at an unhybridized state where you need a 90 degrees angles of the p orb angle of the p orbitals, the van der Waals radii overlaps significantly which leads to severe steric repulsion. So carbon is forced to hybridize. It doesn't want to hybridize, it, it is forced to do so. Uh, as you can see here, we have a 120 degree angle, like in an sp2 hybrid, um, this, this steric strain is mostly relieved. Now, look at, go back to silicon up here. This is the unhybridized state with a 90 degree angle. And if you look at carbon substituents at the silicon atom, which we have, um, then you realize even in the unhybridized state, there is virtually no steric strain anymore. And, um, well, this is really the simple ex explanation for all the differences. Um, electronegativity comes into play, but this is, of course, a secondary effect, which is also related to um, the atoms, in a sense. Now, what are the consequences of this um, when we uh, react this disilenide, this vinyl lithium analog, with uh, a chlorosilane, then the trisilar allyl chloride is not stable but isomerizes spontaneously to a cyclotrisilane um, to get rid of the double bond, which would equal the hybridized state, so to speak. Okay? Now you can isolate these three membered rings. And um, as a matter of fact, with germanium, it's a bit different. Germanium has almost the same size as silicon in terms of covalent radius, but uh, electronegativity wise, it's very close, uh, much closer to carbon than to silicon. And, and sure enough, um, the corresponding germanium compound does not undergo spontaneous cyclization to the free membered ring. And uh, this is just the structure of the uh, lithiated derivative which we just introduced um, this earlier this year. Now, yeah, here's the electronegativities. <coughs> Now, what about a low valent germanium um, electrophile? You can use it, and here you're in for a surprise. We anticipated to get a, um, a vinyl carbene analog now with germanium in the carbene position, like you've seen before in the trisilicon case. However, here the chlorine atom uh, likes to migrate from the germanium atom to the beta silicon atom, and what you then get is an analog 
of vinylidine, which has been proposed as a transient in many um, organic reactions, also in terms of uh, transition metal complexes. Vinylidines are quite important metathesis catalysts and whatnot. Um, here, uh, the, the vinylidine is stabilized by this anhydrocyclic carbon, which stems from the starting material and um, can be handled safely. Now, um, this is, represents a highly functionalized, <coughs> low valent um, group 14 system. Um, I'd like to point out that we have the lone pair, of course, the germanium as a possible functionality site, site of reaction, reaction site. We have the formerly vacant p orbital, which of course is occupied by the carbene, but maybe you can get rid of it in one way or the other. And we have the pi bond, which can do reactivity, and of course, the remote chlorine functionality as well. So uh, a fair bit of chemistry can be expected with this. I don't have time to dwell on this in, in, in much detail. We've addressed all these reactivities. Um, in the time, there's of course also the silicon-silicon sigma bond, but that's maybe a minor reaction site. Now, um, if you want to replace the chlorine with an organic nucleophile, um, and, and in this case, this is methyl lithium, you can actually observe this um, uh, vinyl carbene analog at low temperature spectroscopically, has signature spectroscopic data, um, but uh, uh, at room temperature, the carbene actually departs, and what is then isolated is this uh, tricyclic system chair with a chair conformation um, with the germanium here in this position. And this seems to suggest that actually an unsaturated three-membered ring was formed as an intermediate. Five minutes left, oh my god. Uh, I think I got too many slides. Now, let's move forward. Um, where, okay. Um, now, in case of phosphorus, we can actually not see, we do not see this phosphinidine, which it would be substituted by a silicon-silicon double bond. Instead, we get a, a three-membered ring, the one that I've just postulated in the germanium case, and uh, um, this was actually now accepted by Angewandte Chemie. If you add a Lewis acid, you can rip off the carbene and get similar a similar system as in the germanium case. Now, this actually starts to be very different from what we have uh, seen in um, what we see in carbon chemistry. Now, what about if we have more, a higher degree of unsaturation? In the case of silicon, we can actually use a cyclotricylene lane as a precursor, reductively eliminate carbon, and then get to something that is isomeric to a hypothetical hexacylabenzene, and uh, with, which shows an interesting structure, is intensely colored despite the fact that there is no permanent dipolar moment in this um, silicon species. Now, if we hydrolyze this compound, then we actually get to a different framework, uh, also six-membered, but this looks like the two silicon, the two unsaturated silicon atoms have been adjacent to one another, and this actually starts to resemble um, the silicon 100 surface. We can actually also do, induce the same isomerization of the scaffold by the addition of an anhydrocyclic carbene, and uh, um, this starts to resemble the situation on the silicon 100 surface, and computational models of that have been proposed um, with a nucleophilic silicon atom, so-called up atom, and an electrophilic silicon atom, the so-called down atom. And, um, well, we think that with our system, we now have a functional model of this surface. Now, if you simply heat this SI6R6 isomer, it isomerizes to what is the global minimum of the SI6H6 potential energy surface and thus analogous to benzene. Uh, skip that, um, as you can see here, right? So this is the global minimum of the potential energy surface for silicon 6H6 and thus very, very different from the corresponding carbon potential energy surface. Now, um, 
We can also do this with hetero elements and Balderev has actually calculated what happens if you successively replace silicon by hetero atoms, in this case carbon being the hetero atom. And as you can see here, when you get to silicon richer systems in the all carbon case, sure enough, benzene is the uh, global minimum. And as you replace more and more carbon atoms by silicon atoms, you then get to this as, as global minimum structures. Now we can also functionalize this system um, and Nadine Portier has shown some of this in her lecture yesterday. I don't know uh, if, uh, if you've been there because it was in parallel sessions. And uh, you could then get a functionalized uh, analog of benzene, so to speak, hence the, the silicon analog of phenylithium, if you will. And this can be then used, let's skip the structure, this can then be used to introduce all, a whole variety of different functionalities to this silicon-6 cluster scaffold. Now, um, Nadine has, has also added other functionalities which we will actually apply in polymerization uh, studies in collaboration with Markus Gallay at Darmstadt uh, very soon. Now, this is a silylene substituted um, cluster which was at the center of Nadine's presentation yesterday. Now, we can also functionalize in a different position, and sim this simply by using the other isomer, the global minimum isomer, as a precursor. Then we cleave, reductively cleave, one of the groups in this position here. And uh, uh, Don Tilly, in his lecture this morning, has actually uh, shown a species that, according to NMR spectroscopy, have a certain silylene character, despite not looking like silylene species. Now, here, I would like to point your attention to this silicon atom here. It's tetracoordinate, so certainly it doesn't look like a silylene, only it has a chemical shift of plus 270 ppm. And my time is almost up, I believe. Um, and this can, in fact, be explained, as Don did um, for, in, in, in his lecture, by the molecular orbitals, in particular the structure of the LUMO, which does look a bit like a silylene orbital here. Okay, just um, to um, wrap this up, I will not talk about the, the functionalization in this position, which is, of course, possible. But more interestingly, if you add silicocene, um, in fact, decamethyl silicocene, Yutzi's famous uh, silicon 2 compound, it reacts as an electrophile, despite the fact that this is decacoordinated coordinated silicon, it still reacts as an electrophile. This you don't observe. What you observe instead is a, a, a cluster expanded compound with a silicon 7 framework. Here's the structure of that still signature NMR dispersion, typical for such systems, and this is actually also the global minimum. So we actually move in the valleys of the potential energy surface and what we hope to do and are also actually achieving already is further expansion of the silicon cluster. We can reductively cleave the CP star substituent here and add a, another anionic functionality in this position as you can see here and um, then treat it with silicocene again you get another cluster expansion, only we were unable to crystallize that, but what we were able to crystallize was the water adduct of this uh, compound, and this suggests that we actually have an exohedral silicon-silicon double bond in this species, and here's the structure of the water adduct. Now, so instead of uh, um, concluding or summarizing what I've just told you, um, I would like to stress that this is really a playground for various structural motives that haven't existed before. And in our session on, on the, in uh, the phosphorus work, no, sorry, the boron workshop, um, it was pointed out that new structural motives create a variety of new possibilities. And this is clearly the case with this very, very much low energy SI6 structure, which can be transferred <coughs> to uh, various substrates and a very rich chemistry also in terms of materials is to be expected there. Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, theoretically, this has all already been pointed out by Balakrishna and co-workers um, that have shown that silicon nanosheets may actually not show a silicene structure in analogy to graphene, but instead a structure which corresponds to the global minimum isomer that you've seen on a molecular level. 
And we are trying to explore things in this direction. This I think we can skip. And I thank you very much for your kind attention. For a nice play with chemistry. Uh, now it's time for two questions. So, first, congratulations. This is a really beautiful silicon chemistry. And, uh, uh, yes, uh, I'm just, just a simple question about the air stability of your uh, uh, clusters, let's say. <coughs> yeah, of course, it's a valid question. So, uh, interestingly, the, the global minimum compound, which is very, very low in energy, is kinetically very unstable towards air and moisture. Um, so, this is rapidly oxidized or hydrolyzed. On the other hand, this other compound, the precursor with this tricyclic framework, um, is thermodynamically less stable, but kinetically much more stable. It can actually be handled in air. Um, for minutes without any decomposition, um, so even in solution, right, which is very unusual uh, and uh, is, of course, interesting for future applications, I suppose. Okay, second question. Thank you very much, uh, <coughs> David, for such nice presentation. Uh, let me put one question, because uh, from the beginning of your presentation, we started with a trigonal uh, mm -hmm. uh, silicon-silicon uh, bone. We mo you move to the six mm -hmm. uh, silicon, to seven, to eight. So my question is, uh, where is the limit of the number of silicon in these clusters? And yes. how is stable or the silicon-silicon bone, because you use water, and time to time it seems everything goes to silicates. Mm -hmm. Silicium and bone. <coughs> That's a very good question. Um, and, and as a matter of fact, we are exploring this right now. Um, so now, my coworkers, as we are molecular chemists, I can't deny that. Um, it, they always like to crystallize stuff, right? And I have a very hard time convincing them, well, forget about crystallization, just add alternative, uh, in an alternate fashion, um, the silicocene and the reducing agent to, to, to actually see what happens. And our expectation is, and I think this is a valid expectation, is that at some point the, st the kinetic stabilization by the bulky substituents will be insufficient and then what will happen is, of course, oligomerization of these um, clusters. Now, if you take, say, this is just a number, okay? 10 silicon atoms and oligomerize it. You are at 20, maybe 30 or 40 silicon atoms. Um, and then you're very much in, in the realm of, of silicon nanoparticles. And this is another interest of ours that we tr uh, are trying to develop um, is a silicon nanoparticles, quantum dots uh, in, in, in this regard. And I have this weird idea of a living nanoparticle synthesis. We are all familiar with living polymerization. So with this technique, I think we have everything on board for a living uh, nanoparticle synthesis where you simply, by addition of more reagent, can grow existing nanoparticles further. That would be very exciting to me, but it's, uh, of course, for now, it's just a weird idea. Okay, let's stand.